for having us here. We have been really great being here all this week, and, and, and it's been a real treat to be here and enjoy this week. I'm going to start out uh, with my story in, 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 in basically, like it keeps getting shorter and shorter, like every time I say it, but <laughs> <laughs> like, li like Liliana said, I, I came here uh, almost at the age of three. Uh, at the age of 16, after realizing in Georgia that I wasn't documented and that I wasn't going to be able to uh, do the things that my friends were starting to do, like driving or getting a part-time job or um, getting scholarships and all that stuff, um, I realized that my only uh, choice or my only option was to go back to Mexico if I wanted to pursue a higher education or, or direct my life in, in another sense than just um, working in the carpet industry or, or another kind of a job. So uh, I take the hard decision in 2008, a month after high school graduation, <coughs> to return to my birth country by myself. And I arrived to San Luis Potosí, which is where my parents were born. And uh, I went through a period of like five years not being able to get into college because I found out I wasn't documented in my own country in the sense that I, my education in the U.S. was not recognized by Mexico. Uh, they had all these, um, they still have all these obstacles that make it um, sometimes impossible to revalidate our U.S. Uh, education in Mexico. And after five years, uh, I met Claudia in social media. We were both... Um, searching and Googling dreamers, dreams in Mexico, trying to find if there was something uh, that talked about us in Mexico, because we could hear the dreamers in the U.S., we could hear everything in the U.S., but um, nothing in Mexico. And I had decided to just hide my past in Mexico so that I wouldn't be able to have to answer all these questions everybody, every day I met someone. So I never spoke English except in my work uh, as a teacher in an English institute. But other than that, I didn't have any social uh, activities beyond my job for five years until I met Claudia. And then she talked to me about Dr. Anderson and the fact that she was um, about to write a book and that she was um, searching for stories. And I sent in my story and I contacted her and that's when the world basically opened to me because I found out that there were other people that the topic was uh, starting to be mentioned in Mexico and that I wasn't the only one. Um, in 2014, I go to the presentation of the book in Mexico City. It was a very unique presentation because I spent a whole weekend with 20 something other people that had also returned or been deported. So it was the first time in six years that I had uh, spoken about uh, what I love, what music, what cartoons, what everything, and for a whole weekend in Mexico City. So that was pretty great. And in 2015, uh, Dr. Anderson motivates me to apply for a B1, B2 tourist visa, which is a visa uh, anybody can apply to come here to do business uh, or attend conferences, not do business, but attend conferences, <coughs> and um, do tourism. I had always wanted to do it, but when the moment I left um, the U.S., I really said goodbye to it because for me, it was impossible to, to ever return, even though I had promised to it to do it one day. But when I went there, uh, the whole experience was really amazing because at one moment, I was sure I was going to get it denied because I never lied. I always said that I had grown up in the U.S. I paid $160. I, d I gave them my biometrics and everything. And... Uh, the lady comes back and says, you have a 10-year visa. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you have a 10-year visa? And I'm like, okay. I leave. I ran to Jill's house. And it was amazing the fact that I was going to be able to go back home after seven and a half years. And in, 2015, in October of 2015, <coughs> actually, it was just like a week before I had to travel to California to present Los Otros Dreamers in various cities. Uh, that was uh, like another really important, the first important moment was when I met Los Otros Dreamers and the second major uh, 
moment when, when I was able to go back or come back, come back to, my, to the U.S. And just staring at water fountains, staring at how the cars driving a considerable distance was amazing for me now, <laughs> back then. But it really helped me to close cycles, to close chapters, to uh, really say, I did it. I'm here. I'm back. Um, and now I understand uh, a, a little bit. I'm still, especially right now in this moment, I'm still kind of confused and I'm trying to understand it and accept it that um, I'm de aquí, de allá, that I don't have to choose between one country. Uh, but uh, also because I was able to come back now, it, there's something beyond that. Now I have a responsibility, a commitment, so that other people, uh, because our community is growing and growing, and these people, like right now, a lot of my community are like, you're very lucky you can go back home. And I'm like, yeah, it's a privilege, which is really not so nice to say it's a privilege because it should be a right, a binational right. We are really more and more bilingual, we are more and more bicultural, and we deserve to fight for a binational right. And also our message to our communities here that we are together, that we're gonna fight, that we need to be uh, united and see this as a global, um, with a global and, and transnational vision than just in Mexico or just here. So with that, I'll pass it to my friend Claudia. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Um, well, my name is Claudia Yao Um I came in, in 1988 at the age of 12. Uh, to me, Dreamer is uh, an identity. It's not, it's like to me, it doesn't have anything to do with paperwork, with laws, with anything. Uh, because I represent Los Otros Dreamers, not just because I was in Mexico when the Dreamer term became very popular, but also because I represent those Dreamers that didn't fit in, in the little legal box because of the age or because of other um, things. Uh, I do have a sister that didn't qualify for that guy, and all those she's been in this country since eight years old just because she was a year older than what he should be. So I kind of represent also all those, so those are those other dreamers who never got the, the recognition from the society and the, or the political environment. So um, with that, I can tell you that to me, why is an identity? Because like I said on, in the book when I wrote my story, we are, we are made of parts, like parts from, we are so proud to be Mexicans, and at the same time, in my case, and, and at the same time, um, we have those parts that we love from the U.S. that we got from our teachers from, from growing up here, um, which to me made us like little Frankensteins that now <laughs> both of the governments are afraid of. <laughs> so my story is like I came in at the age of 12. Um, I adopted here. I, you know, you, you don't think about being undocumented. I mean, you go to school and, and then uh, you have dreams. You want to go to university. And I tried really hard to go to university and I couldn't because of my status. And I went on with my life. I uh, lived in Wichita, Kansas with my family, my mom and four sisters. The reason we moved to the United States is because my father was killed when I was 11 years old and my mom was only 30 uh, with four girls. So she didn't feel safe and she also didn't know how to provide for us. So she, she decided to come to this country. Then in 2000, uh, and then in Wichita, I got married and my son was born there. And then in 2006, my husband was going to work and was stopped uh, by a police officer and he was turning to ICE, immigration. I went and tried to help him and both of us got arrested that day. And um, my case was a little bit easier, like I got away really fast with a really minimum bond, but uh, my husband wasn't. So we fought a whole year to try to, I mean, he got out with a bond eventually, but then we had to fight for a whole year until he was finally deported and banned for 10 years. Um, at that point, I had to take a difficult decision because I, I, like Maggie said, I had to leave this country, not only this country, my past, my family, my mom, my sisters, which uh, I, I have a family of mixed status. Some of them were gonna be able to visit me, but some of them, I didn't know when I was gonna see them again. So I decided and I went back in Mexico, which to me was a very bad experience. Like I said, I, I love Mexico, but uh, um, it wasn't only about me. It was, I had a son who but then was six years old. 
who was bullied for being American, who was uh, physically abused by uh, other friends and the teachers wouldn't do anything about it and he didn't have any medical. My husband and I were in medical insurance or anything. Um, my husband and I were undocumented in Mexico for a whole year also because at the time that we returned, uh, it was election time, so it was very hard for us to get the election um, credential, which is like the official ID in Mexico, or we couldn't get a passport either. So for a whole year, we were navigating without any type of ID in Mexico or anything. So it was really hard, and then in 2012, it just got worse uh, when my husband was kidnapped by two police officers, and at that point is when I was really desperate to come back home. Um, we were in a period of very, um, high uh, <coughs> violence and the, the area where we were living, it was pretty bad. My son and I used to see hang bodies from bridges, um, shootings every night. It was just horrible. My son fell into a very deep depression where he, all he talked about was um, dying and not getting to be, not getting to adulthood and um, that life was so hard. And um, so I was just desperate. It was not only my life and, my, and the responsibility of taking care of myself, but it's, it was also my son who I, kn I knew he had other opportunities in his birth country, so which also was my country, or is my country, or my home. And uh, so, like Maggie said, it was really hard because people wouldn't understand how we could love two countries at the same time, how we could love two cultures at the same time. And like Maggie, I also hide my past. I didn't have no past. I didn't have. I didn't see any future. I was living the present, just the present, just by surviving and just finding ways to make my my son's life a little bit, you know, better. Uh, finally, in 2013, um, when I got a hold of uh, Los Otros Dreamers, which is uh, it was Phil Anderson and Moises and a couple more uh, people who are now in the book, and um, they kind of gave me a hope. I like 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 Maggie just like. I saw the light, it's like, it's not just me, you know, it's more people going through the same uh, adaptation period or whatever you wanna call it, uh, and, it, and we're not feel, we don't feel that we're from here or <coughs> from there, we don't, we don't feel accepted anywhere, but it was very hard to just keep it for by yourself, you know. So uh, when she asked me to be part of the book, I wrote the story, but then at the same time, an organization from the United States, which is National Immigrant Youth Alliance <coughs> India, they read my story, and they called me and asked me if I wanted to join a civil disobedience to bring um, an awareness on the fact like, that the US government was just saying that they were deporting criminals and that wasn't the reality, and also to request um, a right to come back home. So uh, nine um, people like me, or another eight plus me, who for some reason were in Mexico, but we grew up in the US, we got together in Nogales, we got prepared, uh, legally, spiritually, physically, uh, for several days, and then we were ready to cross um, to present ourselves at the border. We dressed with our caps and gowns of graduation from the U.S., mm -hmm. and we request President Obama to let us come back home. We knew that we were going to be detained. We didn't know how long, but we were prepared for that. We were in detention in Eloy, Arizona, for 17 days. We did uh, some hunger strikes, and we um, brought up to the public a lot of awareness about how the um, the, the private detention centers were operating um, kind of like with slavery uh, rates uh, the, and the way they treat us. So um, after 17 days uh, in detention and with the power of all the community that were calling and participating and sending us letters to making it easier for us to be in detention, uh, we got released. Over 30 congressmen signed a letter to President Obama to ask for a release and we went back to our homes. I came to which is a Kansas, my home, with my son. And then a month after I was released, my husband did the exactly same thing, but our attorney decided that, that time, at that time that it wasn't gonna be with the community help. It was gonna be just legally, just because he had a deportation and he didn't have as many ties as I had with my family and stuff. So he did it just through the legal process and it took him two years and three months to get out of the detention center. He just got back to us um, about a year ago. He's now in Wichita with that. We're fighting our cases. My son's life has turned completely. <coughs> He's a very happy boy in high school and the varsity soccer team with dreams to go to university. So um, for us, deportation was like a, like a really, really hard process. But of course, with the community and with people like Jill Anderson, like what Maggie is doing now, you know, it, it, it was 
uh, easier for me to navigate after I found it. And now I, although I'm here in the United States, I'm 100% with ODA because I want people who don't have an alternative or a choice and they need to go back there. I want them to have some resources and have some support uh, than when I didn't have when I moved there. It, it feels like a particularly um, significant and poignant time to be able to have these smaller conversations over the course of a week here in North Carolina and to come from from Mexico, you know, the other side of the border, Mexico's being talked about and painted and um, in really to me such weird ways, you know, it, it doesn't really jive with the reality I live with on a day-to-day -day basis as a, as a binational person part of a binational family. I'm originally from the United States. Um, I have been living in Mexico City for the last 10 years. I'm an immigrant to Mexico. Um, there my, my kids are growing up. Um, and I've been doing my academic and activist research there for the last uh, 10 years. And that's how I first met um, young people like Maggie and Claudia in 2012 who were working in call centers. Um, in Mexico City and in the aftermath of deportation um, and return due to the threat of deportation or the deportation of a family member, um, young people have found jobs in, in call centers because they often speak native English, um, they have even sort of bicultural nu nuance that the call centers find very attractive. Um, their call centers, outsource call centers have grown by 116%. Um, in the same time period that deportations have been escalating under U.S. policy. Um, many question whether or not that's just a coincidence um, in Mexico. Um, in some ways, the call centers provide a decent job with benefits um, that is otherwise not available in many uh, Mexican cities and communities. They waive a lot of the obstacles that young people face upon um, deportation and return, such as revalidation of studies, such as having, you know, uh, Mexican documents, you know, you can get with just any ID, you can get a job at a call center. Um, so they're really creating access in ways that the Mexican government and, and Mexican uh, ex academic institutions, Mexican society has not been. And that really, that was my entry point um, in 2012. So sort of getting involved, interviewing young people working in the call center, seeing how the call centers was sort of a um, symptom of, of this recruitment strategy and, and this sort of global, you know, globalization of, and, and taking advantage of, of the global supply chain of this labor force, deported labor force in exile in, in Mexico. There was, you know, they were also creating community. They were, you know, finally, it was the call center was the moment when finally they met somebody like them and, and had this experience that Maggie, you know, and Claudia talked about it, realizing I'm not alone in this experience. I'm not the only one. Um, and they felt recognized and they created, you know, started, you know, within Mexico City started to create this kind of border culture in Mexico City, this third space, this sort of where, you know, as Frankensteins or as, you know, people who are, um, they feel ni de aquí ni de allá, I don't belong anywhere, find each other and create a, a, a new diaspora community. So I, the reason why I did this book is because I, you know, as an academic and a researcher, but, you know, always with one foot actually in, in the public humanities and in um, activism and social justice work, I realized these, I couldn't do justice to these stories in, in my academic work only. Like I needed to do something to raise them up um, uh, with more impact. And, and so I approached the photographer, Nin Solis, a very talented Mexican photographer. Um, and asked her if she would be interested in doing a, a book, a small book, you know, to do this work. I sent out a call for stories, um, realizing that the phenomenon was actually much greater even than what I was hearing and experiencing in Mexico City in the call centers. Um, and I uh, and I <coughs> decided to go and interview um, people with the photographer in places where perhaps the internet wouldn't reach. Um, and and so we you know, with connections with academics and other activists and, and nonprofit organizations throughout Mexico. We travel to Guerrero, Chiapas, Nogales, uh, Oaxaca, and interviewed people. And then every based on the people who wrote their stories, answering four simple questions um, the, about their experience in leaving, 
Mexico to go to the U.S. after usually is young, almost all of us young children, then returning uh, uh, or growing up in the U.S., returning to Mexico and what they've learned and processed and ask people to write. Um, amazing writers return their, their stories. And then I, I actually put sort of my researcher hat aside and, and really approached the stories as an editor um, and, and edited the stories as a collective testimonial. We edited it they wrote, and then they approved it. We translated the stories. Everybody wrote or spoke in the language of their choice. Some people chose English, some people chose Spanish. Um, the diversity is, uh, you know, in some ways mind-boggling of the accents and combinations, um, really hard to, to generalize and dynamic because as pe people become more bilingual over the years in the aftermath of deportation, um, uh, many, many people do, um, e and even without formal su support, you know, just by, by virtue of, of survival. So we, we, this book turned into this beautiful book um, and and really, I think answering the call of you know in some ways I think I was the vehicle for this community to come together. Um, Claudia, you want to show the map? It's the, the and and really it became <coughs> clear that that what we were the book is it has a really important demand even beyond lifting up the voices, which is the recognition of binational rights for those who who identify as bilingual and bicultural. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're not hearing on the national stage. Um, and, and we can raise up, I think, in local and state contexts right now. Those who return, just hearing and understanding this and seeing what people do when they have that ability to heal, to be connected to their families and their communities, to process um, their identities and, and, and both, both the difficulties of it but also the potential of it. It's, I mean, it's so inspiring and, it, and it's really, um, it really, there's a huge contrast between hearing those stories and, and being able to celebrate them and being honored to walk with people and those who are not, who face up obstacle after obstacle um, for any number of, of reasons but of, often around racialized and gendered um, stereotypes and criminalization, um, in particular brown young men are, are very much um, discriminated against in, in, uh, in Mexico and in the U.S. and criminalized. Um, many of the young people in the book uh, actually were deported after spending a year or more in jail. Uh, they have priors. They're not, when we talk about the otros dreamers, as Claudia alluded to, we're talking about the muy otros dreamers. We're talking about, you know, they would not have have uh, uh, qualified for the DREAM Act. Many people in the book would have qualified for DACA if they were here, but many would have never qualified uh, for DACA because of criminal histories. But when you read their stories, when you hear them, when, when you get to know them, it's very clear that they are not these criminals for life or this opaque stereotype of a criminal that's, that's you know, not disconnected with their families and their communities and their futures. And, and many of the young people, taught, they're still, they're looking to join universities to revalidate their GED, which currently there's no way to revalidate the GED in Mexico. Um, they're, they're looking to, to get jobs, to send back child support. It's, it's extremely challenging to make enough in pesos to cover child support in dollars. They're losing custody of their children um, for that and, and the ability to stay in contact with their children, although they very much want to and are reaching out to organizations like OLDA, others like Amuni, in order to continue to do that. And so that, that's another, in, in Mexico and in the U.S., it's so easy to criminalize um, criminals. You know, the, the people who have records, and that's one of the, the other sort of, I think, really important narratives and, and contrib contributions of this book and that has inspired us to continue doing the work um, and organizing and, and lifting up these voices because the criminalization narrative is so pervade uh, right now in Mexico and in the United States, and, and yet their stories are so inspiring and important of, of young men and young women who are rebuilding um, and, and really demanding access and opportunity, which in many ways is demanding a transformation in Mexico also, not just integration into the status quo, not just integration into the same conditions that force their parents to leave Mexico and, and migrate to the United States, 
but to actually ask for transformation, de aquí y de allá. And so with that, I'm gonna, Maggie's going to close and share a little bit about the work that we're doing um, in co-founding this organization, which has sort of been the next <coughs> organic sort of step that I would have never imagined in 2013 when we started this project um, to continue the work of, of the book. Yes, and um, we decided to actually start this with uh, an organization actually in California when I was able to go back home and I felt um, this major responsibility in, in trying to learn how I was going to deal with this privilege, knowing that um, I every week I get messages and Facebook messages of people that say, um, somebody told me you could help me revalidate my high school or somebody told me um, that you could help me understand uh, about this or We've been getting those um, more and more frequently. And um, we knew that we needed to do something uh, that would that we would actually could respond to, to these needs. And, and actually, we took, decided to do it in a more urgent way on November 8th of, of last year, because we were like, this is going to get <coughs> more ugly. So we decided that we needed, by then we already had our website, we already had this amazing logo with the help of our own community, people that have different um, talents and they tell us, I want to contribute because I'm a logo, I'm a designer, or I'm a linguistic and I want to contribute with translations. And that's basically how we have started to grow. Uh, one of uh, uh, a returnee uh, who is in Merida said, I can help you with the design for the t-shirts. And I'm like, okay, send me the design and I'll print them out. So it's been a really collective work. And we have done a major, um, some major projects such as um, Almas Transfronterizas. This is the name we put to our mental um, health. Since a lot of us um, have realized that we cannot continue without um, professional um, mental health. So we work with a collective that is um, that knows and is familiar with the context of migration. Because some of us, Claudia and I, have been in contact with therapists before that they're like, "Oh, you're Mexican. You have to just learn to accept it." So we're yeah, like get over it. You're Mexican and you're in Mexico and you need to just forget it, no? So that really made it worse for us, and we understood that not every um, therapist can work with the with our community. So we are working um, with this collective. We even have a returnee who is a, a psychologist, and she is she has turned into my personal therapist because I work as an interpreter for the U.S. from my home in, in San Luis Potosí. I answer 911 calls. I know all the system in the U.S. such as Medicaid, SNAP, food stamp, health insurance everything and some and detentions i deal with ice i deal with all these interpretations and those are the hard ones so i know i have to reach out to someone and that is one major project and these th these therapies um are offered via skype or social platforms so that our, our community can take them and we're trying to reach out into the families as well and not only the families in mexico but the families here that are separated and and how to guide them that is one thing um we had, our intention was also to, to do a strategy along a, a hashtag 696 and do something what I, like what I did to go to the U.S. Embassy and get a visa and travel with other people, but unfortunately we know that that's not going to be really um, easy to push, so we have uh, changed that. <coughs> we also, at, at, at moments, we uh, uh, talk to different delegations, people with DACA that have traveled to Mexico, to try to create awareness uh, about this issue. That is something that uh, we have been doing. And uh, right now, it's we're, we're really getting involved with universities in Mexico and, and maybe think about what would a sanctuary university in Mexico look like in terms of offering all this, opening their doors to us and, 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 and guiding us through the different revalidation processes with helping us with Spanish, helping us with um, learning the history of Mexico and, and all this. We would really love in the near future to have a community space in, in Mexico City uh, where uh, right now we have a virtual uh, community space. I have here a, a WhatsApp group where a community just responds to needs like 
somebody's mom just had a car accident and he's in another state, but the accident happened in Mexico City. Who's gonna pay an Uber? Who's gonna pay this? How are we going to buy his flight ticket? All those details, we do it just a message and a, a, a message away. Or people sometimes, you know what, I'm feeling really bad right now because somebody called me a gringo, okay? So let's just talk about it, you know? We've all gone through it. Um, also, the language is something really, really huge that our community is struggling with in terms of, um, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable speaking with my boss in Spanish because sometimes I don't understand half of what he says and I'm, I, I don't feel comfortable with telling him I don't understand you. And, and that's been really, really huge. Even myself, in terms of writing, I really struggle. I still really struggle with it. So that's kind of a, along the lines that we want to continue, but also uh, we really have uh, clear that we want to create this identity of de aquí, de allá, that, we need, that yes, we're in Mexico, but we're all part of mixed status families. And uh, there's more and more US uh, citizen children like Claudia's son that are in Mexico. And that's also a, a, a huge uh, part. So we are really clear that we need to be really involved at the Yaya. And our message to our community here in, in, in the United States is that yes, we are with you in this um, resistance moment, and we're going to help you with information, with whatever we can. But uh, we're also here if you end up having to be deported. Uh, recently, just like two weeks ago, uh, somebody suicide one hour after being deported in Tijuana. And we were, that was something really major for me because this, this is something really urgent. Like, yes, people need to resist here, but they also need to know that if it happens, the idea of being separated from our families can also give us more strength to fight. It's not easy, and a lot of people say it's impossible to come back to the States in Claudia. It's like a, it's, it's, it's an answer that says, with community, I was able to come back. She's still fighting, but she can prove that they were wrong, that all the people that said that it was impossible to come back, they think that, oh, why are you doing protests? Why are you sending letters? Why are you calling them if they probably don't even answer or listen? But community really is more, I like something that Claudia said. She's like, community is more powerful and beyond any law. So with that, I close. Mm -hmm. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.